Welcome back, my friends. Jake here. Today, we have a very awesome guest. Uh, I'm very excited to have him on the channel. His name is Dennis Davidoff. And Dennis, before I let you introduce yourself, I want to tell you that my father, who is 70 years old, is actually the one who recommended that I start watching your videos. I think oh. he introduced <laughs> your channel to me about uh, four or five months ago, and I've been watching your daily update videos ever since. For those who might not know who you are, please introduce yourself. Um, hello, guys. My name is Dennis, and um, I'm the airline pilot, at least I used to be. I'm from Ukraine, and since I'm not flying right now, um, I decided to change uh, for the public, for the media. Uh, I started my YouTube channel uh, where I speak mostly about the war in Ukraine. Uh, the ongoing news updates every day, uh, I try to up upload every day. So in your videos, you always uh, start, hello, my friends, and you yeah. often in your videos say, my friends. I actually started doing that in my videos as well <laughs> after watching your videos for a couple weeks or a couple months because I just got this feeling like I had a friend in Ukraine uh, and that we were uh, reporting on this war together. So it was very encouraging, inspiring to me, as I'm sure lots of your viewers feel the same about you. Now, you mentioned you were an airline pilot before the war. Can you just speak about what happened to you when the war began? What were you doing or what was life like those first couple days? Uh, yeah, first of all, about the friends. Uh, I treat my subscribers and I think you, Jake, also you treat, treat your subscribers as, uh, as friends. <laughs> so people like they spend the most precious resource that we have on in our life. It's basically our time. So they spend it watching our videos uh, on YouTube and you know you cannot return back and like this resource cannot be restored like fuel energy and that's why I respect my viewers who spend this precious time on my channel uh, about my aviation career everything was fine however aviation itself it's not very stable industry uh, speaking about the COVID you know and some of the airlines may go bankrupt uh, it happened to me twice like first uh, it was the bankrupt then COVID and here we have the war uh, we thought that it is the worst crisis than the COVID uh, during the COVID times but now the war is the worst we have uh, the airspace closed right now in Ukraine you cannot even fly on paraglider or any kind of commercial airplane, aircraft, uh, anything that flies. Uh, only military uh, planes allowed to fly in our airspace. Mm, first of all, uh, because the military need to, needs, uh, they need airspace. And the second reason, obviously it's unsafe, then, uh, the airs then the rockets, Russian rockets are flying in Ukraine. And they may target everything. Uh, we had heard the rumors that uh, some of the airfields may open in the future, but I'm not very optimistic about it. So uh, my last flight was actually two days before this war started from uh, Delhi to Kiev. was uh, landing in United Arab Emirates and finally I landed here in Kiev. And you know, I was monitoring uh, the flight radar 24. It's very interesting resource where you may spot any kind of airplane, commercial airplane flying live. And I wasn't sleeping the night, uh, then the war started. And I saw Turkish military airplanes, they landed here in Brisbane, in Kiev, uh, probably delivering, I don't know, Bayraktar's uh, weaponry. And like in 10 minutes, uh, they got the information that the war started. Russia closed their airspace, Euro control close to Ukrainian airspace. All of the commercial airplanes asked to leave the airspace. It was a commercial flight from Kiev Brisbane of SCAP Airlines of Boeing 737. They just airborne did the turnaround and land a few minutes before the war. And the last landing in Brisbane 
uh, was not that one, but the Boeing 777 landed from Azure Airlines. It's actually staying and blocking part of the airfield right now in Burispol. And you know, Turkish airplanes are still here. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but still, they cannot fly away. So that was a one-way trip. Yeah, delivering some goods and they stayed. Obviously, crew left Ukraine, uh, but we have uh, the Airbus 400, I think it's A400, turboprop big airplanes. Um, two of them are still here. You can just see them uh, if you are close to Burispo. What do you miss? What do you miss most about your life as a pilot? Uh, and are are Ukrainian pilots somehow trying to maintain their skills and stay current so that maybe when the war ends they can go back to work? Yeah, obviously uh, we have our unions uh, that are working uh, with pilots to restore uh, the currency. Uh, my uh, my type rating expires at the end of this year, so I have the time. But my airline uh, is working on that issue, so probably I'm gonna leave temporary Ukraine uh, because we don't have the flights, full flight simulators here in Ukraine to maintain the type rating. That's why I need to go to Warsaw, uh, Warsaw to Poland, or maybe to Paris uh, for the training. And after that, I may come back. And uh, I will not fly for sure because uh, we have just a few airplanes now flying that stayed at the morning, moment of the war started that are staying were, were staying in Europe and they are flying right now for the vet lease. Vet lease it means that some airlines are hiring our airplanes together with the flight crew, cabin crew, to fly their own uh, flights routes, uh, and they don't need lots of pilots. Uh, for that short, uh, m mostly charter flights. Uh, that's why the majority of our pilots um, are not flying. So I wasn't flying for seven months, and that's what I miss. I miss flying. Um, it, I put all of my life to aviation. I studied like five years. I finished a university, aviation university, academy. You need to have bachelor degree, at least in Ukraine, or university degree to become a pilot. It's the re requirement uh, for Ukraine. So you have to study a lot. And also, you start your career as the first officer, like junior first officer, senior first officer, captain, uh, different airplane type. And, you know, it wasn't always a good time for in aviation. So my first airline uh, just went bankrupt because of the war, actually, in 2014. It was the UTR Ukraine, so the mother airline of that one was in Russia. <laughs> so obviously they uh, stopped financing this uh, Ukrainian airline. And I went to Indonesia actually for a couple of years to fly for the biggest carrier there, Garuda Indonesia, uh, one of the biggest. And then I came back to Ukraine, uh, Ukraine International, and it's fantastic airline we have, uh, very nice um, and you know, uh, like three years ago, it all started messy. Then we lost our airplane in Iran. Uh, Iranians shoot it. And after that, you know, COVID, this war. Uh, for me, it's still not understandable how our airline still exists. You know, in this in these conditions. Interesting. Yeah, it sounds like it's been a very difficult eight years for Ukrainian yeah. aviation industry. Yeah, in indeed. your videos, you've talked about uh, you're from the city of uh, Sevastopol in America. Yeah, yeah, I've always yeah, said yeah. Sevastopol. Yeah, you can uh, say Sevastopol. Yeah. And for people who don't know, there's a very large Russian military base that has always been there, like 170 years or something. Yeah. Can you talk about what your life was like growing up in Sevastopol? And do you have any memories of uh, the Soviet Union? I know you're a couple years younger than me, and that means uh, you were born, I believe, in the Soviet Union? Yeah, I was born in the Soviet Union in 1987, but I don't remember it, um, because I was like four years old and it collapsed. Uh, I do remember the time after it, then we struggled, in the economy struggled basically in Ukraine. And about Sevastopol, I spent... Um, yeah, most of my childhood there. And I would say 
I was partially brainwashed by the Russian propaganda there. Uh, they always want wanted Crimea, I think, to be looking now at that time. I, I think they always want uh, their people to turn to Russians. Basically, they want uh, locals to stop associate themselves with Ukraine, and um, they were going doing some festivals, you know, like motorcycle festivals. Uh, fantastic they put lots of money um, Russians there and you know you have for example in the festival some interesting song and then they stop and say and they put like propaganda just in the front you can, you can see that on the scenes some pioneers uh, communist flags and it's crazy you know it was kind of weird at that time and now I realize it wasn't done like that. Also, I attended parades, Russian parades uh, of the... They have the military parades of the Black Sea fleet. Actually, it was conducted together with the Ukrainian Marine Fleet. They also were based in Sevastopol, but we had much less ships compared to Russia, obviously. And, you know, this Moscow flagship, I used to... You know, it was a big, it, it is really a big ship. It was, yeah, it was a big ship, huge one. And I was watching it live, then it, it was firing rockets. And I never imagined that it may fire rockets towards, you know, Ukraine to our own territory. So it's, uh, I was also brainwashed. I thought like Russia, it's mighty power. Like America maybe is interfering to like to the world they went to many countries especially after you know uh they went to iraq afghanistan it was massive propaganda from the russian side but uh, you know after a georgian war in 2008 i realized that something's wrong here and after 2014 obviously completely 180 degree change for me uh, so I just started to hate <laughs> Russia and everything that is, because they took, you know, my motherland from me. Um, actually, I went here to, to the place uh, near to the Kiev well before uh, the events in 2003, just for studying, you know. I left Crimea before, but, you know, I, I cannot go back. Um, but I still, uh, my grandma and my grandpa, they are still living there. And uh, they're kind of old, so they cannot leave uh, because of the... Ju they just got used to that place, and because of the health issues, they cannot leave that, the place. Well, that's very encouraging that uh, the Russian propaganda that you grew up with mm. in Sevastopol didn't work on you. Hopefully, uh, it can be reversed, maybe, uh, when this war is over. <laughs> you mentioned yeah. your grandparents... Uh, are you still in contact with maybe any other family members or friends? Uh, do, you, do you talk to them about how the war is going? I was growing up. Um, I, I, I cannot say for security issues of my grandparents uh, the, exactly the place, but I was growing, out, uh, growing up exactly at the Russian military base. It was there since independence of Ukraine. Uh, so Russians were staying there. Uh, on the helicopters, airplanes, and all of my childhood friends, uh, they went mostly for Russian military. And um, I do not speak with them any longer for obvious reasons. And um, yeah, I know one guy, is, he's a helicopter pilot, he went like that. And I don't know, maybe he lost his life here in Ukraine, maybe not. I don't have contact with them. So after the 2014, I stopped communicating uh, because they say that uh, like this imperial style that they're going to take Ukraine, they're going to like free Ukraine, that we are not Nazis by that time, but they say we are, we hate Russia. But yeah, we hate Russia, uh, Russian government, because they took our land. It's normal, I think. So when Ukraine retakes Crimea, and I think the probability of that is much higher now than it was two weeks ago, but I think there's a lot of legal complications that people haven't considered because for the last eight years, these people in Crimea that used to be Ukrainian citizens 
are now Russian citizens. Do you think that when Crimea is retaken that they should have to go back to Russia if they're not no, originally they're not. from Ukraine? Or do the Ukrainians who lived there eight years ago have to give up Russian citizenship? Or is there going to be a compromise and maybe they're allowed to keep both Ukrainian and Russian citizenship? Uh, I would say that according to Ukrainian law, you cannot take two citizenships or more. So only one is acceptable. Uh, they're working on that issue to have uh, like two citizenships, but obviously the second one should not be, uh, will not be Russian. Um, and I don't think that they will be allowed to keep the Russian citizenship in that case, but uh, those who stayed in Crimea, who got the Russian citizenship, they will not be prosecuted for that. Uh, because they didn't have um, the other way out, how to continue normal living. So it was the Russian mandatory requirement for uh, civilians to obtain Russian passport. So I would not say it's some kind of betrayed or something. People need to leave. It's normal um, humanitarian uh, aspect of living uh, because many, they they have their own house, you know, they used to live there for, like, my grandparents used to live there all their life. So why should they go to other places? It's their house, their home. They are not like, um, Russians are not treating them as uh, prisoners, let's say. Still, it's a normal life. Uh, so they, but they had to obtain the passport, let's say. Uh, I think they should give it back to Russia. And, you know, European Union and other countries... Uh, they do not recognize uh, Russian pa passports that were given in Crimea or on occupied territories of Donbass. So that you cannot go to European Union or any kind of country with that one. Uh, as for Russians who went to Crimea, um, and I think those should leave uh, Crimea and in legal way, legal. It's not going to be deportation or something. Uh, like massive deportation, but we're going to put legal. Um, so, well, something should be done uh, to f for them to just leave the country uh, because mostly they occupy the local business of Ukrainians. Uh, they occupy like if sometimes houses and apartments. So it's, it's like that. Yeah, I think it's going to be complicated and... I think the it's only way to resolve it peacefully, as far as civilians, uh, a new government in Russia is going to have to uh, make concessions in order for yeah, no. economic sanctions to be ended, and it probably will involve uh, Russians leaving Crimea, I think. Uh, maybe at some points, like in particular, I think every case is very unique, so we need like to... to go through every case and find out what to do with it. So the last two months of this war have um, been more favorable to Ukraine. Hmm. But I want to ask you for the first four months uh, when Russia was still making advancements, how difficult was it for you to talk about the war every day while while the Russians were still gaining ground? Yeah, it was. Uh, but... I always knew that we're going to win this uh, war and especially what inspired me a lot. Uh, then Russia started to leave the places near to Kiev, Chernigiv area and uh, Sumy. Um, so it was the goodwill gesture, they say it uh, by that time. And that inspires us, inspired us a lot. But honestly, during the first, um, let's say, five days, I was almost sure that Russia would take Kyiv because they they advertised their army, advertised before the second army in the world that they're going to take it. They showed all their military uh, soldiers, armored vehicles on parades, mighty power, really uh, interesting. And because they were in lack of competence uh, during this invasion, uh, we were able to you know, change the situa situation for us uh, here near to Kiev, and it was really morale push for our army. And since that time, I understood that we're going to win it. Then we saw 
I was we were scared here, uh, people and also military. Uh, then we got the information that it's like uh, 50 kilometers column staying near to the Kiev of uh, tanks, uh, BTRs, uh, uh, artilleries. They're just staying, waiting to enter the Kiev. But like in a week, we saw the pictures uh, on telegrams, in media, that this column was destroyed uh, by our aviation and our artillery. So it was really inspiring. And that is where I started my uh, daily updates of Ukraine. But first few days or even weeks, I was like in frustration. I was thinking about what to do next, what, how, how to save the family. Actually, um, then the war started. I already told my wife that uh, Putin told that they're going to start the war. Probably it's not going to be on in Donbass only. So we need to this night on 21st of February to take all of our belongings and go uh, somewhere far from the city. And exactly then I say those words, we start to pack our things. In two minutes, we heard the loud bangs, our buildings start to shake. And we understood, yeah, it is, it happened. And, you, you know, we took like what was very close and near and went to the car and just to run away to my wife's relatives who live in a, on the countryside. So basically there is no military uh, infrastructure, nothing. And I was living there for two months. <laughs> and I went to the, yeah, I, I went to the local military branch and they say they don't need me because I don't have the military experience and say, okay, we don't need you, just go somewhere. <laughs> and I went to... Uh, the local uh, officials who put me on a checkpoint and I was on checkpoint for two months uh, and after that I went to other point in Cherkasy and we were living there because uh, uh, I cannot go back because my house is very close to the military base like 100 meters away so it is a great risk of being attacked by Russians. So still, I cannot go home. <laughs> interesting. That's interesting that you, you say that you attempted to join the military. Yeah. But I want to express to you what I think a lot of people, a lot of your subscribers think, is that you are contributing to the war effort by making these, uh, these videos, these war updates, these uh, positive messages. And you could have made a YouTube channel in Ukrainian or Russian. You probably still would be getting lots of views. But because you challenged yourself and chose to do this YouTube channel in English, uh, you're now spreading information to all of the democratic countries around the world. Uh, yeah. You have lots of subscribers in the EU, lots of subscribers in America and Canada and Australia. I'm sure even Japan, South Korea and everywhere around yeah, yeah. the world. Yeah, that's that was a proper choice, I think, because uh, Ukrainian topics start to uh, lose attention after a few months. Mm, I want to rise up the topic uh, in the Western public because we, mostly we have help for Ukraine from Western countries, Western allies. Without that help, uh, we would begin in a few months. Now we have mostly Western-made weaponry fighting in Ukraine. We used uh, the ma major part of the Soviet resources. So for those who don't know why I started talking about the Ukraine war, I, uh, prior to the war starting, I was talking about finance, investing, and stock market stuff. And at the time the war broke out, uh, I, was holding, uh, I was holding some shares of an def American defense contractor, a company. And the price was spiking because everyone thought there might be a war. And I made a video saying, I don't think there would be a war. I don't think it would go as well for Russia as Russia thinks. I then even said, you know, those first couple days I was making finance videos, but also just saying there's a war going on and this is affecting the global economy with sanctions and all that stuff. And I remember seeing all these crazy reports of, you know, that convoy going to Kiev from the Belarus border. And I remember seeing how uh, 
confused to the Russian soldiers were. They were surrendering, not even knowing they had invaded Ukraine. Yeah. They thought they were on exercise. Uh, I remember reports saying that they were ordered to bring their dress uniform because they thought they were going to have a Victory Day parade in Kiev. They didn't bring more than seven days worth of food and fuel, but they brought their service dress to have a Victory Day parade. It was at that point that I said uh, Russia had maybe seven to ten days to pull this off, you know, take the capital city, get the professional Ukrainian military to stand down. After ten days, I said it was too late. Uh, this yeah, is going yeah. to go very badly for the Russian military. They did not prepare for a real war. They prepared for this yeah. uh, surprise, shock and awe, get them to just surrender, get Zelensky to flee the country. And it didn't, it didn't work. Uh, for us, it's a mystery, actually, Jake. For us, it's uh, and I think it uh, the decision for invasion of Ukraine was done in a very small circle near to Putin. Uh, since uh, you you understood, yeah, that's right. That m even military commanders they thought that they were on some kind of exercise, soldiers. So it wasn't expected for them. And also, you know, Russia left more than three hundred billion dollars in european banks that are blocked right now so if you're gonna start Put war, putin's economic yeah. advisors <laughs> didn't even know the war was going to happen yeah, yeah. if his economic advisors knew the war was going to happen they would have pulled that money back to russia but they just did what any responsible economic planners would do and they spread out putin's money over lots of global yeah, banks yeah. to de-risk it and on day one putin lost half of his money yeah, indeed. And that's why I think it's like a, there were not many people involved in a final decision for this conflict. And, you know, we have internal investigation. The local journalists in Ukraine, they investigated um, the President Zelensky and his circle, uh, how they thought if the war's going to be started or not, because we got the information from United States officials, uh, sorry, intelligence, uh, that there's going to be the war. And Zelensky was almost sure that it's not going to happen. We almost, everyone here in Ukraine was almost sure that it was, it is not going to happen because it's total nonsense, like, to start it. But uh, I think one or two days before the war, Zelensky knew that it's going to be. Uh, <laughs> Well, I think I think foreign intelligence, Western intelligence knew because some Russian general is being paid by the CIA to leak this information. I'm sure think, the CIA had the invasion plan. They had the maps. They had all the schematics. They knew exactly what was going to happen. I think, Jake, uh, not just generals knew. I think it was done. I think United States intelligence, they have... Uh, their spies in a very close proximity to Putin and his circle. Uh, because as I said to you, the decision was done. I think, uh, looking at the circumstances, I think it, it was done in a very small circle. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I ask you, how is the Ukrainian economy doing? I know with a war going on, things can be bad. But how do you feel like the Ukrainian economy is holding up? And are there any severe shortages of anything? Uh, it could have been uh, worse. We all thought we were surprised that we have internet, banking services working, everything. Uh, for now, if you live in Kiev or neighboring regions, especially in the western side of Ukraine, you will not find a big difference other than checkpoints on the roads. So the life is the same. We still have curfew for the night time, but we have clubs working, we have restaurants working, everything. And, you know, according to the bank statistics, people spend most of their money in cafes and restaurants. So it doesn't really affect the lifestyle of majority of the people population but obviously then you move to the eastern side you'll find the devastation and completely different life uh, we have the bank limits for example per day you cannot withdraw more than i think two thousand six hundred dollars from your bank account 
So if you have like millions or hundred thousands, oh, you, yeah, cannot, yeah, okay. you cannot pull them out just like that. Also, if you uh, want to transfer money, transfer your funds, a uh, bank may ask uh, special documents to confirm the operation before it wasn't done like that. So we have like the regulations here and there. It was a big fuel crisis, by the way. It lasted for a couple of months, but somehow we got over it and now we have fuel everywhere. And uh, still we have um, problems with spare parts. Mm, I like motorcycles and uh, I put my Honda uh, on maintenance and I wanted some spare parts. And now we have problems um, with the delivery from eBay, from other resources. Um, so yeah, you have to wait quite a lot for it. But other than that, everything is working as before. I think because we have the limited access to Ukrainian ports in the south, before it was, uh, all the shipment was done there. And by the way, we got the American cars mostly, uh, used American cars that uh, then locals buy from auctions in America. Deliver, uh, so we have those cars delivered to Odessa ports. Now you cannot do it. Yeah. What do you think is happening with Russia and on Kremlin State TV? They're talking about either we have to go to the negotiating table or mass mobilize the civilian forces. Do you think there is a serious possibility that Russia could officially declare war and mass mobilize their people to get another 300,000 Russian soldiers quickly into the Ukraine conflict? Mm. Um, I don't think it's the proper way out for Russia because uh, if they declare the war, um, they will be excluded from United Nations according to the stat statute of United Nations. So uh, each country should gather up uh, against the invader. And that is why they call it military operation. Uh, that is why we are not declaring the war towards Russia. Um, because our allies ask us not to do so. I think so. Um, they may announce the massive mobilization, but mostly we see the mood of the Russian people. They, yeah, the majority still supports Putin, his regime, and they like to comment. They uh, like to enter the war from the, their sofa, not actually going there. I want to say that it's the good idea for Russia itself to mass mobilize the people, but they may do it. Um, if you go to the history, there was a mobilization during the Alexander the first time uh, during the war against Japan at the beginning of the 20th century. And then those people, the mobilized soldiers, they went against the Tsar regime and uh, itself. So I think Putin also scared about uh, what may happen to his regime. That is why I don't see that they may announce it. Uh, and if we speak about the practice of that, they couldn't invade Ukraine using like modern weaponry, armored vehicles, then they had them, flagship, Moscow, uh, then they had enough rockets. Uh, so what would they give to those people? Like old Kalashnikovs, Soviet-made... Mosin uh, rifles? Yeah, Mosin rifles, T-62 tanks. Uh, so I don't see the resource uh, for those mobilized. Obviously, they can throw them. Yeah, they can do whatever they want, but I do not see the future, like bright future for Russia in that case as well. When when Putin loses this war, loses this special military operation, mm -hmm. do you think it's possible for him to remain in power? Or do you think that because uh, he wasted so much money and time mm -hmm. and, and, and soldiers that inevitably someone is going to remove him from power in the Kremlin? Um, it's one scenario. And the other scenario, yeah, he, he could, could be removed by his own circle. Uh, the other scenario is that Russia will be a closed state um, like North Korea with the dictator leader in power. 
Uh, I don't know, and no one knows, I think, uh, the true power of Putin, his circle, and whether someone may uh, attempt to remove his uh, him from the power. Mm. In general, I would say that Russia would change, uh, but I don't know, Jake, what to say about the future of Russia, honestly. No there one can predict. Of, we're, we're going yeah, there are one day at a time, and I think, I think when it happens, uh, if it happens, it'll be very sudden. No one will predict it. Mm. For example, Putin has not made any public statements uh, about the Kharkiv counteroffensive yeah. the last two or three days. How can he be completely silent uh, when everyone is looking to him for either direction or inspiration or clarity? Putin is offering nothing as the commander in chief of the Russian forces when they're struggling. And I imagine they need they need some some guidance on what he wants them to do. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I think Jake. Uh, there is also a scenario that Russia would collapse into several small, smaller countries. Uh, today, by the way, I check out the news that Georgia is on the referendum. Um, the government wants to perform the referendum whether they should announce the war towards Russia and take back the occupied territories of Georgia. Well, that's that's what's happening with Azerbaijan mm. and Armenia. Mm -hmm. They're uh, mm -hmm. what Russia can't. I think I don't want to get the names wrong, but I think Russia can't support or help Armenia anymore. Yeah, so yeah. Azerbaijan is trying to take back this territory that has been disputed for a very long time. Yeah, so, I think so I imagine it's also bad news for pro-Russian forces in Syria or maybe even Transnistria, if if yeah. something were to happen there. Yeah, well, since indeed. we mentioned Transnistria, what is what do you think of that territory? What do you think of those people? Because they are on the Ukrainian border. Um, honestly, Jake, I never like personally encounter the conversation with Transnistrian people. All of the information I got is from the social media. Um, I know that they mainly pro-Russian. Um, and now what I know that uh, the Russian peacekeepers who are in that territory, they cannot leave it. So because they are close territory between Moldova and Ukraine, Moldova refused to give them permission to leave that territory. And basically they are just stuck there. Um, so it's been, it's been seven months and those Russian yeah. soldiers can't rotate out because yeah, yeah. it's a landlocked territory. That's but interesting. I, I know nothing about Transnistrian life. Uh, and I'm, so I'm not expert in that part. So. All I've seen is what I've I've watched on YouTube, and it seems like a very strange place. But uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. There's always yeah. there's always talk that maybe Moldova wants to join Romania and just become part of Romania. Uh, maybe that would be better because then they would be part of the EU and part of NATO. I think they will be the part of NATO and EU anyways, whether they become the part of Romania or not. I think they are a little bit separate. They have the similar culture, but I don't think they're going to be one country in the future, in nearby future. I was in Belarus, however, a um, long time ago, before the war started. And I would say it's like a good old Soviet Union. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, we have those, um, like I call them Soviet memorials, the factories that uh, stop working after the Soviet Union collapse. Well, Belarus uh, tried to maintain that, and then we went to Belarus. Uh, I saw actually the Soviet factories are still working, so they tried to do it. But still, we asked for the salary. Oh my God, Jake, it's it's severely low. So I don't know why people are working there. So and they they honestly hate their regime in Belarus. So every people who I talk, so you see like nice roads, uh, clean parks, no advertisement, no billboards, nothing uh, like Soviet Union. And if you ask how do people live, mm, they do live quite bad. I, I think if Russia experiences political change, I think political change will also come to Belarus. Yeah, I think so. Th 
Dennis, when this war is over, uh, will you continue making YouTube videos? What do you want to do when the war is over? Yeah, I think I'll continue. It's my passion. I actually, I'm a YouTuber for two years already. Uh, I have my other channel dedicated to aviation, but I upload there not very often because aviation ended for me for now. Uh, but I will continue to upload and it's very difficult uh, what, to, what to do next. Because I know that this topic is kind of limited until the war is over, obviously. Maybe I told to my subscribers, to my friends already, that I'm probably going to convert it to some sort of the travel blog. Travel blog. Uh, firstly, going to uh, travel around Ukraine to show many places on motorcycle, probably. And then go to every country that supported Ukraine. <laughs> Just to speak with people, record it, discover... Have subscriber meetups? Uh, probably, yeah. Who knows? <laughs> um, that's just a, an idea. So for now, I just... Actually, honestly, I don't like uh, what I do here. <laughs> it's not my format. I usually fly the airplanes. I film it. Uh, my airline and local regulations allow me to do so. Um, here it's not my format, but I have to do it just to make people informed. After yeah, I applied to um, local military branch, they say goodbye. I started my own war, and now I will not go to military. So I have my own stuff here, and I would agree with the most of my subscribers that I do lots of good stuff here uh, on YouTube. So we're gonna continue, and later on maybe travel blog, maybe. But I would not uh, like to continue on some sort of different political news. Uh, no, I'm not that competent in that. So probably transfer to uh, travel blog or blog. I have a couple more questions from you that subscribers wanted me to ask. How is your arm doing? Oh, it's great. I actually, yeah, it's still not working fine. <laughs> but it's, it's uh, much better than before. It has a lim limited uh, amplitude, but yeah, I think it's going to be okay. For now, I cannot fly. <laughs> if, yeah. If I would be flying, like I would not fly for maybe two months or something. People want to know, what is your uh, favorite Ukrainian food, Ukrainian dish? Oh, borscht. Um, and, but, you know, borscht is a kind of very specific dish. Um, every... Every chief uh, may perform its own borscht, his or her like own borscht. So it's very specific and I don't know, I like meat. I'm not vegan for now. <laughs> um, you know, steaks, beef, that stuff. Today I made a barbecue here near to the house. Um, yeah, so stuff like that. Do you speak any other languages other than English, Russian, and Ukrainian? Unfortunately, no. Um, unfortunately. No, my, my wife's wife, uh, my wife's sister, sorry, she went to um, Switzerland so as a refugee um, because she was in, in a house that was attacked <laughs> uh, near, near to uh, the Kiev, and she left. Uh, because she has nowhere to stay. And um, now she had to study German. So I think I should, you know, study some other language just in case. Uh, not German in specific, but, yeah, you know, Spanish is very interesting. Then I used to work in Indonesia. Uh, I realized that half, like not the half of the world, but lots part of the world, they speak Spanish because there were people from Mexico, Uruguay, Spain, and they all speak, spoke one language, you know, <laughs> Spanish. Very interesting. Spanish is definitely very useful here in North America. Oh, um, are you now in North America, Jake? Yes, I currently live in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, oh, I am awesome. American. My, my hometown is Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Oh, super. Las, uh, Las Vegas is a nice place. It's, it's uh, I just moved here this year, uh, oh. and yeah, I, it's too hot in the summertime. This is yeah. the desert, but uh, it's a very fun city, and 
lots of family and friends finally want to come visit me uh, in order to visit Las Vegas. Do you go on gambling or something? I I'll do it. You know, maybe I'll I'll, I'll go right. like with a hundred dollars with friends if they if they want to do it. But I I personally don't. I don't see the point, <laughs> you know, oh, uh, I if I trade, you. if I trade stocks or options online, I feel like there's more skill or knowledge involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas when you gamble in a casino, it's more or less all random. I would rather, it doesn't appeal to me because I, I don't think there's any skill. Oh, I see. I see. Because in Ukraine it's forbidden. Like gambling is forbidden. There's no casinos. But, no, <laughs> I think, um, uh, you know, I might be wrong because um, there were some low. There was some law introduced that maybe some of the casinos are allowed just in a, some hotels, and the hotels should not be less than four stars or something. So I'm not sure. It was the project. Uh, I'm not sure whether they took it or not. But in Ukraine, it's very popular to bet on the sport events. Very popular, and know why. So I have a, a funny story for you. I used well, to live in South Korea, and mm -hmm. in South Korea, gambling is illegal, but they mm -hmm. have casinos. And the only people allowed to go to the casino and gamble are foreigners. So mm -hmm. in Seoul and in Jeju and in other tourist locations, there are casinos, but you have to show your passport uh, for a oh. different country in order to get into the casino. Because oh, the government owns all of the casinos and makes lots of tax revenue from people, from foreigners who want to gamble. So I always thought that was very clever and very interesting. Yeah, indeed. Are there any last words you want to share with uh, the viewers, Dennis? Anything you want to say to them? Um, just, guys, uh, thank you so much for supporting Ukraine. Thank you so much for watching our channels. And, yeah, you're our friends. and. Thank you so much for it. I echo that sentiment. Thank you everyone for watching and supporting and giving a thumbs up to both of our videos. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And maybe in the future, we can have Dennis back on the channel again. Until yeah, the next video, so. take care, be safe.